I have a bulletin for those of you who have been polite enough to turn off your cell phones and your Blackberries and not, have not heard the latest news. China has announced a $100 million investment in the Peterson Institute <laughs> by its sovereign wealth fund, the China Investment Corporation. The objective appears to be to either buy off the institute on RMB policy or to steal our secrets or both. Um, Treasury Secretary Paulson is on the way to China to, with a counterproposal, a swap of the institute for Tibet. <laughs> However, if he fails, he already has indicated that he, the CIC takeover of the institute will be referred to by A. Sills and the CFIUS for a national security review of the transaction. Such are the hazards of speaking on April Fool's Day. <laughs> so now that I have your attention, let me thank everyone for coming today for one of Fred's famous free lunches. Uh, the lunch is not entirely free, of course, because you're going to have to listen to me hold forth on sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and based on the policy brief that's in your folder and uh, a blueprint for sovereign wealth best practices, uh, and a copy of the PowerPoint as well, which will be hard to read uh, in some cases, but summari basically summarizes the policy brief. I do want to thank uh, Doug Dawson for his hard work assembling the information in the brief and also to thank our publications magicians for whipping the text into final shape in record time. My, uh, my, uh, my presentation has four parts. First, I'll offer a few facts about sovereign wealth funds, SWFs for short, and, and review some of the major issues and concerns that they raise. Second, I will prevent a revised and updated scoreboard for 44 of the funds. Third, I will talk about translating the scoreboard into a set of sovereign wealth fund best practices. This provides a basis for evaluating the results of the IMF sponsored dialogue in this area. I noticed that Fred left out uh, my work on IMF reform. That may be because I failed so miserably. Um, anyhow, that dialogue has, uh, has been recently blessed by the IMF executive board. Uh, and the result is expected to be unveiled in mid-October. And then last, I will offer a few closing comments on implementing uh, the best practices. So first, a few facts. Uh, economists and policymakers disagree about some of the facts, so let me define my terms. Sovereign Wealth Fund is a descriptive term for a separate pool of government-owned or government-controlled financial assets that includes some international assets. This is where some different definitions differ. Uh, summarized in this slide and listed in more detail in Table 1 in the policy brief, there are in my universe 54 Sovereign Wealth Funds of 37 countries. They include essentially all the funds, 44 in total, that we have been able to identify uh, that are not linked to national pension systems. The total also includes a sample of 10 large government pension-related funds. Some would not include any pension-related funds among sovereign wealth funds. Others would only include funds that are primarily financed out of general fiscal revenues rather than from employee and employer contributions. My view is that both types are relevant in considering best practices. The basic aim of pension and non-pension sovereign wealth funds are essentially the same, and they raise essentially the same issues of government control and accountability, regardless of their structures, mandates, or sources of funds. In any case, these 54 funds hold about 5.3 trillion in total assets. As you can see in the slide, this is present and is presented in more detail in Table two in the policy brief, their holdings of foreign assets are about three and a half trillion. It is the management of these assets that is a pr principal international concern. And foreign assets can be broken down further into 2.7 trillion held by non pension sovereign wealth funds and uh, 0.8 trillion held by pension sovereign wealth funds. The latter figure could be at least doubled if we were, if we accounted for all government pension funds, bringing the total sovereign wealth holdings of foreign assets to more than $4 trillion. 
Fred always likes big numbers, and that's his big number for the day. Um, so, as I've written elsewhere, the rapid expansion of sovereign wealth funds over the past several years has exposed two tensions in the international financial system. First, the growth of the funds reflects a dramatic redistribution of international, that means cross-border wealth, from the traditional industrial countries like the United States to countries that historically have not been major players in the international, financial, uh, in, in international finance and have had little or no role in shaping the practices, norms, and conventions that govern the system. And second, governments own or control a substantial share of the new international wealth. This redistribution in the control of wealth from private to public hands implies a decision-making framework that is at variance with the traditional private sector market-oriented framework with which most citizens of industrial countries are comfortable. These twin tensions are manifested in five major concerns. First, governments may mismanage their international investments to their own economic and financial detriment as well as with negative consequences for the global economic and financial system, including large-scale corruption in the handling, in handling huge amounts of money. This concern is the principal reason why it is in the interest of a country with a sovereign wealth fund to favor the establishment of internationally agreed SWF best practices. Second, governments may manage those uh, investments in pursuit of political objectives, raising national security concerns, or economic power objectives, for example, promoting state-owned or state-controlled national champions as global champions, as global champions. Such behavior contributes not only to political conflicts, but also to microeconomic distortions. Third, financial protectionism may be encouraged in host countries in anticipation of the pursuit of political or economic objectives by the funds or in response to their actual actions. Best practices would help to diffuse this element of the globalization backlash. Fourth, in their management of international assets, SWFs may contribute to market turmoil and uncertainty. They may also contribute to financial stability, but their net contribution is difficult to establish a priori, in particular if their operations are opaque. Fifth and finally, foreign government owners of international assets may have conflicts of interest with the domestic or foreign managers of those assets or with the governments of the countries in which they are investing. Government ownership adds a further dimension in trying to balance open markets and macroprudential regulation. At this point, these concerns, with the exception of the first, about the interest of the country, uh, uh, are largely in the realm of the hypothetical. They are much more salient in the context of cross-border investment by government-owned or government-controlled financial or non-financial entities. Nevertheless, a loud and often acrimonious public discourse about SWFs is underway. In response, many officials have called for the establishment of voluntary, a voluntary international set of best practices for the funds. This slide, which may be a little hard to read, but it's in the, in the packet, uh, summarizes some of the proposals for the content of SWF best practices that have been articulated by G7 officials, by the IMF, by the European Union, by U.S. Treasury <laughs> officials, and uh, as Fred mentioned recently by U.S. Treasury officials in collaboration with their counterparts from Singapore and Abu Dhabi. As you can see, the recommending content starts with institutional structure or governance. Uh, some suggestions under this heading are more detailed than others. A second common theme is transparency or disclosure. A third theme is accountability, though accountability is explicitly mentioned less often, but in my view is the overarching principle that should guide the entire exercise. That is, accountability to citizens of home and host countries, as well as to politicians and market players. A fourth theme is risk management and policies and systems. And finally, both the U.S. officials alone and with their colleagues from Singapore and Abu Dhabi have mentioned some other features that would like, they would like to see included among the best practices listed at the lower right. These principles are essentially hortatory in nature in that they would be very difficult to translate into best practices, measurably guiding and conditioning the behavior of the sovereign wealth. 
So the natural place to start in designing a set of sovereign wealth fund best practices is with their actual practices. And to this end, Doug Dowson and I have created a scoreboard for 54, 44 of the 54 funds that were listed in the earlier table. The 44 includes the 10 pension sovereign wealth funds uh, and as well as uh, 34 non-pension funds. Uh, the scoreboard includes 33 elements grouped in four categories, structure, governance, accountability, and, tra and transparency, and behavior which roughly correspond to the content suggested in the official views summarized in the previous slide. At least one fund, in fact always several funds, receives a positive score on each element. We have scored the funds based on systematic, regularly available information, publicly available information. The results are, are presented in table three of the policy brief. This scoreboard is a revised and, ex and expanded from the one we released last October. It includes 11 more funds and eight more elements, as well as updated information. And this slide um, summarizes the information in the table. As you can see, no fund scores 100%, meaning 100 meaning a perfect score on each of the 33 elements. The pension funds shown by the red lines uh, score higher than average. However, the top group of 20 funds that score above 60 includes 10 non-pension sovereign wealth funds. The bottom group of 14 funds that score below uh, 30, uh, the, the two lowest at nine, and 10 funds are in the middle between 30 and 60. The point here is that not all funds score the same, nor is there one group of good funds and another group of bad funds? The form, performance of each of them can be improved. At one level, it would be easy to translate our scoreboard into a set of sovereign wealth fund best practices, just convert our 33 elements from questions into statements. However, it is useful to try to gain some understanding of some of the issues and challenges in doing so. This slide which may be a little difficult to see, but gives you visually some idea. Um, it summarizes the information on tables four through seven of the policy brief. The 33 elements are listed on the left-hand side, uh, and the bars show the level of compliance by the 44 funds with each element. For example, at the top of the chart, Almost all funds have a clear publicly stated objective, but we judge that the statements of our objectives of four of the funds were vague or incomplete, resulting in an overall score of 95 out of 100. At the other extreme, only seven funds have a clearly articulated rule or guideline for how they go about adjusting their portfolios, including three non-pension funds as well as two pension funds resulting in a score of 18. The colors in the chart indicate the four categories, structure, dark red, governance, Yale blue, that's a reference to for God, for country, and for Yale, for those who went there. Um, accidental, but I thought since we had it, we'd make that point. Uh, uh, accountability and transparency, green, and behavior, orange. The number on each bar is the total score for all 44 funds. The gray portion of each bar indicates the score for the non-pension funds alone. You can see that the funds do reasonably well on structure, that's the red bars, have a mixed performance on governance, a similarly mixed performance on accountability and transparency, and do least well on behavior. Overall, the funds score 75% or higher on six elements, and 50% are higher on 22 and less than 50 on, uh, on 11. We do not have time to go through each of the categories in detail, but the next four slides in tables four through seven in the policy brief provide summaries. This shows the structure component. It is intended to give confidence to citizens of home and host governments that SWF activities are embedded in a sound overall institutional structure with a clear objective, with a well-articulated investment strategy, 
with fiscal treatment that does not undermine macroeconomic stability and separate from the country's international reserves. Most of the sovereign wealth funds comply reasonably well on the, this, on the, element, the elements of this category. The weakest le level of compliance is for the fiscal activities of some non-pension sovereign wealth funds uh, that are not always well integrated with the country's budgets. And where such a framework is in place, the guidelines are not always followed. The governance category is closely related, of course, to structure. But here it fo we focus first on the relationship between the government and the managers of a sovereign wealth fund. In principle, the role of the government should be to lay down the broad investment strategy of the fund, and the manager should be left to execute that strategy, including making decisions on individual investments. Such a governance structure would help to ensure that the decisions are made based on economic criteria and at arm's length from political considerations. You see in the slide that the majority of sovereign wealth funds comply with the first three elements, but in less than half the non-pension sovereign wealth funds do managers make all investment decisions. This category also includes two elements relating to whether funds follow guidelines for corporate responsibility in their investments and somewhat more controversially, ethical guidelines. Interestingly, there is a high degree of compliance with both elements among the pension funds, but very low compliance among the non-pension funds. In my view, this is a major area where the former should emulate the latter to help provide confidence about their activities. The largest number of elements in the scoreboard and in my blueprint uh, is in the accountability and transparency category. The category includes aspects of risk management as well as more traditional dimensions of accountability and transparency. It consists of 14 elements in four subcategories. Uh, investment strategy implementation, where compliance is quite high but could be improved among the non-pension funds, investment activities, reporting, and <coughs> auditing. The rate of overall compliance by sovereign wealth funds in publishing the size of their portfolios is quite high, 78 out of 100. However, seven non-pension sovereign wealth funds do not make such disclosures, and five others only provide partial information. The funds that do not comply with this element include two of the nine that are thought to hold more than $100 billion in assets, those of Abu Dhabi and Singapore. In addition, some funds are thought to be very, some fund, in addition, some funds that are thought to be very small do not disclose their size either. This is apparently a contentious issue. In the policy brief, I speculate about the rationale for such non-disclosure. The best answer is domestic politics, but in my view, that answer just does not wash. One might think that there would be substantial reluctance among, uh, turning to another topic, one might think there would be substantial reluctance among sovereign wealth funds to disclose the currency composition of their assets and their specific holdings. But a majority of pension sovereign wealth funds do does so. Moreover, eight non-pension funds disclose the currency compositions of their holdings in full, and another six do in part. At least four provide full information about their specific investments, and three others provide at least partial information. Reporting and auditing are central to accountability and transparency, of course. The record of compliance on these elements is pretty good, though many of the audits of non-pension sovereign wealth funds are not published. The final category in the scoreboard in the blueprint for sovereign wealth fund best practices is behavior. The elements in this category are designed to address a few of the areas that most concern some observers of the activities of such funds, including their risk management practices. Do they have rules or guidelines about how they adjust their portfolios? Do they limit the stakes they take in companies? Do they rule out taking controlling stakes? Do they have policies on leverage and the use of derivatives? Consequently, the elements on this category are likely to be the most controversial in the blueprint. However, they are largely self-explanatory. Uh, therefore, I will limit myself to two oral comments. Limits on stakes and not taking controlling stakes. Most pension sovereign wealth funds, but only a few non-pension funds, 
have publicly stated limits on the size of the stakes they take in individual firms. It has been suggested that a sovereign wealth fund that takes a non-controlling stake in a company should be forbidden from voting its shares, presumably increasing the probability that the investment is passive, a concept that has no generally accepted legal definition. Such an approach by the United States, if applied uniformly, would disenfranchise several trillion dollars of investments by U.S. state and local government pension funds. If the United States did not apply this type of restriction to domestic pension sovereign wealth funds, it would still risk disenfranchising U.S. government pension funds and their considerable investment activities abroad. It would be difficult for the United States to apply such a restriction to foreign non-pension sovereign wealth funds and not to foreign pension sovereign wealth funds. As a consequence, governments almost certainly would retaliate in kind. U.S. Treasury Assistant Secretary Clay Rowley has endorsed a more sensible approach in my view. Either a sovereign wealth fund would choose voluntarily not to vote its shares or should disclose how it votes, as is now done voluntarily by some U.K. institutional investors and is required by the Securities and Exchange Commission for U.S. mutual funds. The objective of the SEC rule for mutual funds is to address concerns about conflicts of interest. More controversial is whether the, fund that, whether the fund does not take controlling stakes. Some observers argue that the sovereign wealth fund should not do so. For that reason, at least, our evidence is of interest. Fifteen, or almost half, of the non-pension sovereign wealth funds declare that they do not take controlling investment stakes. And a few others limit their controlling stakes. Eight of the ten pension funds do so as well. In the former category, 17, the 17 sovereign wealth funds that do not make any such declaration, there are most likely, they most likely include a half a dozen or so that do not take controlling stakes, but do also do not advertise this fact. So where does this leave us with the blueprint for sovereign wealth fund best practices? This slide allows us to revisit the content of sovereign wealth fund best practices that has been suggested by various officials and institutions. As you can see from the check marks on the first three headings, the blueprint covers most of the points that have been mentioned. Where there is a question mark, I'm just not sure what the officials mean by the phrase. Uh, I also have question marks on risk management. The blueprint covers several aspects that are normally part of sound risk management practices. No doubt, a few other features could be included. However, against the background of recent developments in global financial markets, to say that there is no codification of sound risk management policies would be, I think, an understatement. Moreover, a mere statement by a sovereign wealth fund that it has sound risk management practice policies provides limited comfort. Details are more important than embracing general principles. It may be in these areas officials in host countries favor supervisory inspections of sovereign wealth funds beyond those that would be covered by published independent audits. They have not said so publicly, uh, and to advocate this type of supervision clearly would escalate the debate over sovereign wealth funds' best practices. If Clay Lowry were here, I was going to ask him to answer that question, but uh, you'll have to put it to him yourself. Finally, you will see that the other items on the slide are marked with an X. In my view, these so-called principles largely involve feel-good statements of good intention. Beyond their superficial political appeal, they have little practical content without a strong supporting set of sovereign wealth funds' best practices. With robust best practices, statements such as these would be uh, largely superfluous. A requirement that the sovereign wealth fund state that its investments are based solely on economic considerations has this character. The U.S. suggested principle that a sovereign wealth fund should commit to compete fairly with the private sector is more relevant to the, to the activities of a government-owned or government-controlled financial or non-financial corporation, corporation than a sovereign wealth fund, except if the sovereign wealth fund is supporting a government-owned entity. It is also not clear what the content is in a principle that a sovereign wealth fund should respect host country rules. Moreover, the United States does not require similar statements from other inward investors. In this, this connection, 
I would point out that one of the four principles for countries receiving sovereign wealth fund investments that was endorsed on March 20th by the United States, Singapore, and Abu Dhabi is that recipient countries should not discriminate among investors. Perhaps they mean discriminate among countries, but my basic point still holds. So we come to implementation. How should we judge the results of the IMS-sponsored effort to reach consensus on a set of sovereign wealth fund best practices? I would apply three tests. First, the best practices should cover substantially all the elements of the blueprint. Given that 18 is the lowest score on any element, no element could be tossed out as idiosyncratic because it is not widely embraced. Second, compliance should be comprehensive by the dozen countries that have funds in the range of $100 billion and up. They should comply or at least explain why they chose not to do so. This is the standard that is being applied to hedge funds and private equity funds, firms in their voluntary disclosure regimes, and it could be applied here. We can talk about other parallels in the, uh, in the question and answer session. Third, compliance should involve more than lip service to broad principles. These sovereign wealth fund best practices should be self-enforcing so that the general public can test compliance. Alternatively, there will have to be a fund bank surveillance feature as with other codes and standards. What about other dimensions of enforcement? At this point, I would remain lie on naming and shaming and expect in short order a high level of compliance. But some countries that receive sovereign wealth funds investments may want more. Countries today have very diverse regimes covering portfolio investment and foreign direct investment in their countries. Pending the establishment of a broad consensus on those regimes as they apply to government investments, such as being pursued within the OECD, and perhaps even in that context, the United States and other similarly situated countries might reasonably decide to take account of a country's voluntary compliance with international best practices for sovereign wealth funds as one of a number of factors considered in making the determination about whether a particular sovereign wealth fund's investment should be blocked because of a threat to national security. For example, in a letter uh, of March 13th sent to U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, Representatives Barney Frank, Carolyn Maloney, and Louis Gutierrez suggested that a country's compliance with the aspects of sovereign wealth fund best practices could be used by the U.S. Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, that's CFIUS, as a factor in determining whether the CFIUS should grant that country a waiver from full investigation of an investment by a government-owned pension fund under the 2007 Foreign Investment and National Security Act, known as FINSA. This sounds reasonable to me. So, in conclusion, accountability is the overarching principle built into my blueprint for sovereign wealth funds best practices. My blueprint, based on the scoreboard I have presented, can be used to evaluate the IMF-sponsored dialogue. It would appear to meet the relevant desiderata of G7, US, and EU authorities. If the IMF-sponsored effort is to be successful by my standards, sovereign wealth funds would be substantially demystified, and in the host country and in host countries, many political concerns, concerns would be allayed. At the same time, the citizens of the country with the funds would have more confidence in their sound operation, and there would be more of a stable and predictable environment for sovereign wealth fund owners and managers. Thank you very much.